Father, we do ask you to speak, speak on earth, speak in this service, speak in your word to us this morning. We know in, in one sense it's impossible for your word not to speak because we're not asking for some mystical experience that would make a, an otherwise dead text living. Your word is living in and of itself. It can't even be read without you speaking. But we do ask, Lord, that your spirit would open the eyes of our heart, that we would behold wonders in your law. And we ask that your spirit would infuse faith wherever there is doubt. Fortify us with conviction. And prepare our hearts to see your glory as you have revealed yourself in your word. We ask this all for the glory of your Son in this church. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, I want to just say uh, personally to the cans, hello. <laughs> it's good to meet you guys, and uh, so glad you guys are here. Um, uh, just sweet hearing you say it's been three years since you've been here. And uh, since you have left, I came, and so I've been praying for you <laughs> since I've come, and uh, good to see your, see your faces. Um, it really is, uh, no doubt, the, what, what the church is experiencing, seeing you back, I get a fraction of that, um, just because of uh, the thrill of seeing what the Lord's doing through you, um, the people group there, and, and uh, it's just it's thrilling. It's really thrilling. Isn't it a reminder, kind of at a corporate level, it's a reminder of the miracle of regeneration. When you see a, an individual come to know the Lord, you see the miracle of the Holy Spirit transform a life. Um, it's just such a powerful, powerful display. This is completely supernatural. And uh, what you're seeing there in Mariroro is, is corporate, a church birth, which is supernatural in the exponential degree. And so that's just thrilling, really sweet. Well, it was 1944 when C.S. Lewis gave the memorial lecture at King's College, the University of London. It's called The Inner Ring. He began the address with these words. May I read you a few lines from Tolstoy's War and Peace? When Boris entered the room, Prince Audrey was listening to an old general wearing his decorations who was reporting something to Prince Audrey with an expression of soldierly servility on his purple face. All right, please wait, he said to the general, speaking in Russian with the French accent which he used when he spoke with contempt. The moment he noticed Boris, he stopped listening to the general who trotted imploringly after him and begged to be heard, while Prince Audrey turned to Boris with a cheerful smile and a nod of the head. Boris now clearly understood what he had already guessed. That side by side with the system of discipline and subordination which were laid down in the army regulations, there existed a different and more real system. The system which compelled a tightly laced general with a purple face to wait respectfully for his turn while a mere captain like Prince Audrey chatted with a mere second lieutenant like Boris. Boris decided at once that he would be guided not by the official system, but by this other unwritten system. In this passage that he began with from Tolstoy, he just documents that in that little encounter there's a display of two social sets of rules, two sets of cues, uh, two sets of and senses of belonging. There's the formal. There's the one that's external and recognizable. And there's one that's um, a little more subtle. It's um, a little bit more intangible. He calls that the inner ring. What's, what Lewis describes as the inner circle or the inner ring is a tangible manifestation of the desire to fit in, to be known, to be understood. Not all of those are sinful desires, of course, but they certainly underscore some of the drive behind this social phenomenon of clubs, networks, 
cliques, particularly those networks or social circles with unwritten codes for entrance, um, those with uh, membership that don't have any recorded roles. When membership in these inner circles are particularly well established, C.S. Lewis goes on to say, he says that the insiders simply refer to themselves as we and us. Being in in the inner circle, when you really identify with the, the inner circle, there's, uh, it, it's like having a subtle social password. It's just a, it's a password that changes uh, very quickly and uh, might not require you to check a box that you are not a robot and might not ask you for a security question uh, to recall. It's a it's like a secret handshake that never actually materializes in front of anyone that could be seen by anyone on the outside. It's like an unwritten set of rules that determine whether you're in or out. And C.S. Lewis even goes on to say that sometimes those who think they're in are actually out, and sometimes those who are actually out think that they're in, and so on it goes. The inner circle, this insatiable drive to identify with a group, to be identified with them, to relate, to be on the inner circle. When I say identify with, I, of course, I'm not using the term in the way that the uh, postmodern social uh, uh, society uses it, in the sense of I self-identify as. That's important to clarify. But I actually am very thankful that we live in a postmodern world because I uh, take great pride in my ability and liberty to self-identify as a millionaire, actually. I self-identify as a millionaire. I'm just waiting. I have a bank that's very oppressive. They do not respect that. They, only, they continue to marginalize me by only recognizing the funds that I put in my account. But nevertheless, I'm not using the term that way. I'm talking about identifying with people that we like, want to be like, or want to be liked by because we gain something from them. We seek to relate to them, to enter their world, and to fit in with them. Identifying with someone usually reflects attraction. In our culture, though, we do have occasionally an exception to this. Right now, we have a culture and a society that's identifying with and relating to and seeking to protect and exonerate the underprivileged, the oppressed. And here, quite often, I mean, that certainly could be noble, and in some cases it actually is noble, but quite often, this is our worldly selfishness most on display because we're posturing under the rubric of philanthropy and looking as though we are actually doing something selfless when it's actually nothing more than virtue signaling and a public display of our greatness as we seek to arrive in an inner circle. The real question, if we were identifying in a selfless way, would be who has been the last person to promote a social movement or an inner circle that identifies with the oppressive class, the abuser, the politician who abuses power for selfish gain? Who's the person who says we, we, we need to relate to and seek to understand and identify with a personal enemy? Boys and I, a few years ago, read Corrie ten Boom's uh, story of her imprisonment in Ravensbrook. Some of you have read that. At the end of uh, the book, she relates, and, you know, after she'd been out for years, this is, uh, I believe, in the 60s, uh, like 15 years or so after World War II was over, she, she meets a, na a Nazi guard from Ravensbrück, and she saw him, and she recognized him immediately. He didn't recognize her. And she described the difficulty, and not even to relate to him, not even to identify with him, but simply to forgive him. And she said in that moment, only the gospel could have enabled me to forgive someone who was so personally offensive to me. Knowing what she suffered, 
knowing that her sister died at this man's hands. That's a notable act of forgiveness. But even God was not calling her to identify with him. Who does that? Only God. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 9. In those days, Jesus came forth from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels were ministering to him. Shockingly, God identifies with us. He identifies with us in the person of Christ, because Jesus Christ became a very real man. In fact, if you... If you follow Mark's narrative here from verse 9 to verse 13, typically, I mean, even in the NES, they break it up into two paragraphs, which is very appropriate. The first three verses, a a paragraph about his baptism, and the second two verses, another paragraph that I would typically have viewed as simply the story of his temptation. And even studying it again, I realized that's not even accurate. Because the thrust of verses 12 and 13 is not the temptation. The temptation is mentioned in verse 13 in an adverbial participle. It's not even the point. It's simply serving another point. But the thrust of this whole narrative is that God identifies with us. God identifies with man. And I I, I, I fear that we in the church might become a little bit inoculated. um, uh, We just become accustomed to the incarnation. Jesus became man. Yeah, Jesus was man. Uh, Yeah. Do you realize God took the time and the misery to identify with us? And not in the sense of self-identify, as though Jesus just said, well, I'll act like a man for a bit, though I'm God. He actually was man. He actually became man, and he lived a real human life. And this man shows up in verse 9. He gets baptized like many, many, many other men and women from verse 4 through verse 8 from Judea and from Jerusalem. And you think, here is another man. And he is. But by the time you finish his baptism, you realize this man is God. And then... God the Son gets sent out into the wilderness by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as you keep reading, you realize that God is actually not just acting like a man. He's a very real man, and he's living out his entire earthly ministry, not walking on the water as deity, but actually dependent on the Holy Spirit for everything in his earthly ministry. And so, we're going to look at how Jesus identifies with us. In verses 9 through 11, he identifies with us because he's identifying with us as with sinful man. As with sinful man. That sounds shocking, but that's exactly what we find here in verses 9 through 11. It's not enough to say that God identifies with us as man. That's true enough. This goes further to say he identifies with us as sinful man, though he was not sinful. But he does identify with sinful man. Verse 9, so Jesus in those days came forth from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. That verse should sound a little bit familiar, a little bit of an echo there, because it's very parallel to what we read last week in verse 5. And all the country of Judea was going out to him, speaking of the him as John, and all the people of of Jerusalem. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. 
I mean, you think about what's happening here. Verse 9 comes along and picks up three explicit parallels. First of all, you've got baptism in both verses. Secondly, you have John the Baptist performing the baptism in both verses. Third, you have it occurring in the Jordan, both in verse 5 and in verse 9, explicitly. Three explicit parallels. You could make a fourth, because what's implied then is that people are going out either from Judea or Jerusalem or Jesus from Galilee going out to the wilderness to be baptized by John in the Jordan River Valley. And so you have all sorts of parallels here. And if you were paying attention last week, you remember John's baptism is a baptism of repentance in the filthy Jordan River associated with Gentile proselytism to Judaism, associated with Naaman, the leper, being cleansed, a leprous Gentile nonetheless. It's associated with uncleanness, um, Gentiles, pagan, secular, worldly people who need to be cleansed. And John was preaching a baptism of repentance. And so here comes Jesus, and he is baptized. Now, that's shocking in and of itself. And, you know, Mark doesn't even record the story that John does about John saying, uh, I need to be baptized by you, and you're going to have me baptize you? I don't think so. And Jesus says, permit it. And so John quickly submits and says, okay, I'll baptize you. And um, so that's profound. But John knows this is the one he's preparing for, and he has no need of repentance. What's important is the difference between verse 9 and verse 5. And there's two of them. Verse 5 has the many, and verse 9 has the one. You have many being baptized in verse 5. In verse 9, it's just one. It's just Jesus, all by himself. The second major distinction is the last phrase in verse 5 is not repeated. In verse 5, it says that all all Judea and all uh, Jerusalem go out to John, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Verse 9, silence. Jesus has nothing to confess. No sin to confess. So the question remains, so then why is he being baptized? Why in the world would Jesus be baptized? took on humanity. He wasn't posturing as a man. He was man. And mark this, is man. God the Son has always existed. He has no beginning. His personhood is infinite and eternal in both directions. But the God the Son took on humanity at a point in time, and he has a human and divine nature for eternity future. He has identified with us not by self-identifying as some sort of fictional act, but in a real sense, he has become man. And here he goes so far as to identify with man in sin. But he identifies with man in sin while remaining sinless, with nothing to confess. By the way, you remember the words of Paul? I want to just remind you of the phrase that Paul used in Romans chapter 8. Lest you think, Mark, maybe, just, maybe Jesus went too far. Maybe John the Baptist went too far. Maybe this shouldn't have happened. Listen to the words of Paul. He says, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus literally was in flesh, and he was in the likeness of sinful flesh. So though he never committed sin, he had a... A a fleshly body subject to the curse, just like the rest of us. He got sick. He got tired. He grew weary. And here he identifies with man in sin to identify with man in the plight, in our misery, in our self-inflicted poison of sin. And he comes out to John, and he is baptized. Just seems like it's going too far. But he identifies with with man and sin. The other thing that this act would accomplish, of course, is it would accomplish what Mark said was true from the Old Testament. If you go back to the quote in verses 2 and 3, 
as it was written in the Old Testament in Exodus and Malachi and then Isaiah 40, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. And so Jesus, by coming to John to be baptized by him, votes for John, puts it, signs his name on the dotted line, and says, he is my precursor. He's the one. And so, in a long line of sandal prints leading to the Jordan River Valley, Jesus jumps in line and goes out there himself. But lest there's any confusion about this maybe having something to do with a needed repentance or needed confession, God speaks into this scenario to remove all doubt that there's something unique about this man. In a long line of men being baptized, this man is God. And verse 10 says, immediately... And this becomes a very Markan word. Uh, Mark uses this word more than the rest of the New Testament combined, exponentially more. And this is his first one, immediately. So right on the heels of him being baptized, coming up out of the water, while he's coming up out of the water, um, which, by the way, it was funny reading some of the commentaries, uh, you know, depending on who you're reading. Uh, some said, well, there's, no, there's, no, uh, there's nothing here about the mode of baptism. Um, well, I'd, I'd say that's pretty hard to... Pretty hard to sprinkle by coming up out of the water. I guess you could say he sprinkled so much water that uh, he had to come up out of it. But that's pretty much indiscriminate, distinguishable from, from immersion. But nevertheless, he's literally coming up out of the water. And in that same act, while that's happening, he sees the heavens opened. And um, if you're reading the NAS, uh, being parted is the, is the marginal translation. Um, I, I, I think a literal is just, it's being rent. It's being torn. It's being ripped in two. It's a very strong word. It's a unique word. Mark only uses it twice, and it's very important how he uses it both times. Right here, the heavens are ripped in two. What happens is, of course, the Spirit, like a dove, descends upon him. And some debate about whether that's the Spirit looks like a dove or he's descending like a dove, you know, adjectival versus adverbial. It's not a big, not a big difference, but yeah, I guess the difference would be whether he's flying like a dove or whether he looks like a dove. But Luke makes it very clear. He has the bodily appearance as a dove. And so the Holy Spirit is actually appears like a dove and then is descending, uh, and he lands on Jesus. And this is an anointing of the Holy Spirit sent from God the Father. And you couple that with verse 11. Out of the heavens a voice comes, and there's no debate who's speaking because now you have God, the one who, in, who dwells in the heavens, speaking on behalf of his son, saying, you are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. God the Father speaking to God the Son with God the Holy Spirit coming down and anointing him and resting upon him. You have the entire trinity right here in two verses. The heavens are ripped open as Jesus is coming up out of the water. It's powerful. You know, the heavens are supposed to be the separation between God and men. Remember the way Solomon said it? Solomon says, in, in Ecclesiastes 5, he says, God is in heaven, you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. It's a radical distinction, a radical divide between God and man because of the heavens. And here, that radical divide is ripped open, immediate access given. God the Son, the Son of God, has become man and has begun his earthly ministry to fulfill all that was prophesied about him. And so the heavens are torn open. I'll hold, I want to hold off for a second on the second use of torn open or ripped in half uh, on Mark's language. Before I do that, I want to tell you a story. So I hope this doesn't distract from Mark. I'm going to tell you a story about a Jew named Zivi Nasi. Nasi is the word for prince, and his name became Heinrich Prince, or later when he ministered in, in England, Christian William Henry Pauli. He was born in... Breslau, and then he died in Amsterdam. He lived in the 1800s. He was a distinguished 
Hebrew grammarian. He was a translator, a lecturer, an author. He was the youngest of six children. His dad was an Orthodox rabbi in Breslau, Silesia, which is a province of Poland. And he was orphaned at the, at the age of 14. He became a rabbi uh, following in his father's footsteps. His father was a notable rabbi himself. And C.V. was zealous for his people and for his God. And so in 1824, he's in his early 20s, he publishes a, a book called Sermons for Pious Israelites. He publishes it in the German language. He's an expert in Jewish literature, especially the Targums, which is the Jewish translation of the Hebrew Bible into Aramaic, which would have been the common language of the Jews in the first century BC. And so even before Christ came, this would have been the, the um, authorized, the, the traditional articulation of the scripture in the Aramaic language. And he became an expert in these scriptures. As he began studying the scriptures in the common language, he began to be amazed at what he realized was a technical term in Aramaic. The term is memre, which just means word. It's the Aramaic word for word. And the translators, the Jewish rabbis of the uh, Targums in those days, anticipating Christ before Jesus of Nazareth even walked the earth, they translated the, the, the presence of divine persons who show up and do not cause instant death on behalf of the people who see him. They would translate that person with the word memory. And so he realized this, and he started to become a little concerned because he began to realize the Messiah is all over the Scripture, and he is Jesus of Nazareth. And so, realizing that Yeshua the Nazarene is the Jewish Messiah, he began to share what he learned with others, and he even began teaching that in the congregation, and even began teaching what then is called for the Jews the renewed covenant scriptures, which is the New Testament. This led to his persecution, his separation from the synagogue, and then he ended up um, leaving. He, became, uh, he moved to England, began teaching Hebrew at um, Oxford University and began a, a missionary society to share the gospel with Jews. I want to read to you his English translation from the Aramaic of a messianic passage. It's in our Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63. You can turn there because I'm going to show you something in your Bible here in a second. Isaiah 63. And just like we do with the word Yahweh, we often translate it with all caps. Tzivi Nasi translated the Aramaic Targums whenever he saw the word Memre with W-O-R-D, all caps, because that is the translation for the Aramaic word Memre. In Isaiah 63, verse 8, he translated this. And he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. And his word, capital W, capital O, capital R, capital D, became their salvation. Verse 10, they rebelled against the word of his prophets. Now that's not the capital W-O-R-D, that's a created word. That's where he's translating that as the word of the prophets being spoken. And they blasphemed, and his word became the enemy. Capital W, capital O, capital R, capital D. In verse, 13, in verse 14, as a beast is led in a plain, the word led them, which is pretty fascinating because as you see in the English in Isaiah 63, verse 14, it says, as the cattle which go down into the valley, the spirit of the Lord gave them rest. And so there it's talking about the third person of the Trinity and the Aramaic translators translate that with the same word, Word, the expression of Yahweh God. In verse 17, he translates, um, Our heart is not turned away from you, from you, your fear. Return your Shekinah to your people for the sake of your righteous servants unto whom you have sworn by your word, capital W, capital O, capital R, capital D, to make the tribes amongst them 
your inheritance. This is a very messianic passage. It's been messianic since before Christ came, and it's messianic in the Hebrew, it's messianic in the Aramaic, it's messianic in the English. Look at your Bible, pick it up in Isaiah 63, um, verse, start in verse um, 7. I will make mention of the loving kindness of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has granted them, according to his compassion and according to the abundance of his loving kindness. For he said, surely they are my people, sons who will not deal falsely. So he became their savior. And that word savior there is one of the Aramaic translated word. God became their savior. Verse 9, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. He identified with the people of God. He came to minister to them personally. And now look at verse 9b. And the angel of his presence saved them. Who's that? The angel of Yahweh, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the covenant, Malachi 3, my messenger, Exodus 23. My name is in him. He's going to speak my words. Listen to him and don't disobey me. Right here is the second person of the Trinity. The angel of his presence saved them. And in all the affliction of the nation, he was afflicted because he personally has present, Yahweh's presence was among the people because he led them. Remember, pillar of cloud by day, fire by night. In his love and in his mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Another passage in Isaiah with the entire Trinity all stacked up right there. God's their Savior, the angel of the Lord's delivering them, but they are grieving his spirit, and so he became their enemy. Just like he would become any enemy of anyone who would oppose the people, those who rebelled against the Lord became the enemy of the angel. Verse 11, Then his people remembered the days of old of Moses. Where is he who brought them up out of the sea? With the shepherds of his flock. And if you're reading the NAS, you'll notice that it says some manuscripts read shepherd. Well, the Aramaic Targums do. So does the Greek translation. There's many translations of the Old Testament that have a singular here, which would read, Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit in the midst of them? The personal presence of this shepherd, the angel of his presence in verse 9, shepherd in verse 11, is the one who put his Holy Spirit in the midst of them. Who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses. He divided the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name. Who led them through the depths? Like the horse in the wilderness, they did not stumble. As the cattle which go down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. So you led your people to make your name glorious. To make yourself a glorious name, excuse me. This is a clearly a messianic passage describing his, the historical account of the Exodus, bringing the nation out of the Red Sea, and the shepherd... The angel of his presence comes up out of the water. And then you skip down to, verse 60, to chapter 64, verse 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. If only God would just tear open the heavens and break this divide and separate uh, the, the, what's keeping us from, back from God, to open up immediate access to God. And here comes God the Son coming up out of the water, and God tears the heavens and sends down the Holy Spirit and anoints him. I don't believe for a second that that's coincidence. Let's get back to, let's get back to Mark chapter 1. So God rends the heavens. He tears the heavens in two, tearing the divide between God and man. The second time Mark uses this word tear, Mark chapter 15. It's going to be a while since we get here, until we get here, so go ahead and turn there and look at it with me. Mark chapter 15, in verse 38, Jesus had already, he, died, he cries out in verse 37 and breathes his last, and so in verse 38, this is the first thing that happens after Jesus' death is recorded. It says, and the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and it's hard not to think about God's separation from man by virtue of the heavens, thinking of Solomon's statement, God's in the heavens, we're not, we're on earth. And thinking of the same man, Solomon, praying when he dedicated the temple, the heavens and the earth can't contain you. How much less this house that I have built, can it really contain you? 
and yet God's glory takes up residence in the temple. And here, Jesus dies, and the veil is torn in two, rent asunder, access to sinful man given by virtue of the ministry of God the Son. Verse 39, when the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. The only human description that Jesus was the Son of God in the entire Gospel of Mark. Jesus identifies with man by becoming man. He identifies with sinful man by being baptized by John. God the Father stamps his approval all over him, showing he has nothing to repent of. And then comes the content of the phrase, You are my beloved Son, in you I'm well pleased. Wow. It's hard to even know what to say about a verse like that. It's important to re recognize the, the wording from Psalm 2, from Isaiah 42. It's important to recognize the context of those two scriptures. But suffice it to say that in the anticipation in Psalm 2 of an earthly king who would rule and reign with total dominion where God and his anointed are laughing at every possible enemy, human hearts, human fists, raised up in animosity against God, and they just simply laugh. Because all dominion that God has always had and always will have are going to be manifest in a man, the anointed God the Son, and the psalm ends, kiss the Son lest he become angry. Dominion given to man because we're created in the image of God, dominion given to us that we fouled up, Christ restores. Jesus is baptized, identifying himself with sinful man, and God says, wait, hold up, this one's different than every other baptism before. And he says, this is the one with whom I delight. You think about God the Father, you think about what delights God the Father. What, what excites him? What gives him internal pleasure? What does he rejoice at? He has infinite, untarnished perfection and righteousness. His son. That's what God the Father delights in. God the Father delights in his son. Don't doubt for a second, as Jesus is identifying with sinful man, that he's displeasing to his father. The father didn't say this to anyone else but the son. In verse 12 and 13, we see he identifies not just with sinful man, but he identifies with us as sinful men in a cursed world. Look at verse 12 and 13. Again, I was refreshed, marching into the classic story of the temptation of Jesus, ready to preach on the temptation of Jesus, to realize that the temptation of Jesus is actually serving another point. Verse 12, immediately, as soon as the Spirit takes up, uh, anoints Jesus, and that's not to say that he wasn't under the Holy Spirit's influence, as though he was an unspiritual person, as though he was disobedient. What that is to say is that what happens here at the baptism is an anointing for the purpose of his earthly ministry that is unique. And so now, he, by the power of the Spirit, just says the Spirit impelled him, cast him out, threw him out. It's like, Christ is such a perfectly submissive and godly responsive agent to the Spirit's influences that whatever the Spirit desires, that whatever the Spirit wills, Jesus does with perfection. He's not doing that in a way that, because, you know, he's just, after all, he's God. He had the advantage. He's a real man, and he humbles himself and there's no self-reliance. He relies entirely on the ministry of the Spirit and becomes the example of a spiritual man for us. And the Spirit throws him out into the wilderness. Verse 12 ends with the wilderness. Verse 13 begins with the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for 40 days. And of course, he was being tempted by Satan, and he was with wild beasts, and the angels were ministering to him. What's the emphasis here? The emphasis is on Christ 
identifying with man and showing up at the baptism and God saying, this man is God. And as soon as God says, this man is God, you see a story where it's also true to say this God is man. He comes under the, spirit of the Spirit's influence and he goes out into the wilderness and he's experiencing the wilderness. The wilderness. The curse. I mean, why else does he mention wild beasts? He mentions wild beasts because there shouldn't have been wild beasts. Wild beasts are a reminder of the curse, the reminder of the fact that they still have not obeyed the covenant. He's tempted by Satan because Satan is the tempter and Satan is continuing to afflict the, the race of men and he hates the seed and the seed promise and he's going to oppose the seed promise with everything he has. The wild beasts, you know, uniquely recorded here in Mark, um, they reflect the fact that Israel has not fulfilled the covenant and so here he is in the wilderness. The Spirit sends him into the wilderness. He remains in the wilderness. He's out there for 40 days in the wilderness being tempted. Now, I'll just be honest with you. I expected to launch into a sermon about the temptation. You think about the temptation. I love thinking about the temptation. It's, Christ is glorious in the, exult, in, the, in the temptation. Why did Satan tempt him that way? Why did he give him those temptations? Mark doesn't say anything about that. Matthew records three temptations. Luke records three temptations. Why didn't he tempt him with Immorality. Why didn't he tempt him with fraud? Why didn't he tempt him with opportunity to get away with violence and perpetrate his will on innocent people? Because none of those things are attractive to the Son of God. He's righteous. So what do you tempt Jesus with? You tempt him with things that he's rightly attracted to, like sustaining his own life so that he can fulfill the mission his Father gave him, or like receiving the object of worship of all the nations of the inhabited world. That is his right. But of course, he tempts him to get those things that he should rightly want in, a, in an unrighteous way. Not by trusting the Father, not by humbly obeying the Father, but by getting them for himself, which would have been sin. But that's a sermon on the temptation from Matthew and Luke. This is a sermon from Mark. Jesus can't be tempted. I mean, sorry, God can't be tempted, excuse me. And here he is in the story being tempted. This God is certainly man. Without becoming man, there is no temptation. There's no identity with us. Of course, you knew that the Holy Spirit had to come. We've looked at those passages, about six of them from the book of Isaiah. Holy Spirit has to take, uh, anoint the, uh, no, um, the Messiah in a very special way. And you know that the anointing of the Messiah is a sign that he's going to anoint the entire people of God. And when the entire people of God are anointed, then that'll be the fulfillment of all the conditions of the covenant. And you know that here you see Jesus in his humanity relying on the Holy Spirit. And there's even a chiasm in verse 12. Uh, the Spirit is influencing him. In 13B, uh, 13C, the angels are ministering to him. And in 13A and B, in the middle, there's a contrast. First of all, Satan tempting, and then he's with wild beasts, all sim sim uh, um, symbolic of the fact that Christ is not yet reigning on earth. This is a clear demonstration of Jesus identifying with us. He identifies with us by actually becoming man, he identifies with us even in our sinfulness by being baptized, though he was sinless. And he, don't ever imagine that there is any lack of ability on Jesus' part to identify with us. He lived a very real human life. He faced very real temptations. He bore burdens. He relied entirely on the Holy Spirit. He did not get himself out of temptation or get himself out of burdens by snapping his divine fingers or walking on water of his own will. He did it by relying on the Holy Spirit as a man. Because of God identifying with us, not just acting like it, but actually becoming man, he can help us in temptation. He's compassionate with us when we are weak. He is an intercessor and a high priest. He is an example of faith. He's an example of relying on the Holy Spirit. 
we hear God speak when he speaks. He has all authority. He knows experientially our burdens, our temptations, our uniquenesses as sinners, our uniquenesses as weak, fallible, flawed human beings. He can reign as man, as the second Adam, to reverse the curse, restoring the dominion that God gave man that we fouled up. Oh, and did I fail to mention he can become a substitute for us in our sin? Without God becoming man, there's no hope. We've committed the crimes. Man has to pay the price. Fundamentally, this is critical for the introduction to Mark's gospel because we're about to see God the Son display the glory of God throughout his entire earthly ministry. One last observation, verse 13. You remember the 40 days? Is that familiar? It's happened already, 40 days in the wilderness, 40 days in isolation, 40 days without food and water, namely Moses on Sinai before God revealed himself on Sinai, namely Elijah, 1 Kings 19, before God revealed himself to Elijah, same mountain, different prophet, 40 days without food before God revealed himself, 40 days in the wilderness before God reveals himself through Jesus' earthly ministry. It's profound. This is critical for Mark's gospel because we need to understand God identifies with us. This is the story of God the Son, and he is very really a true man. Father, we're so thankful that you became, Father, that you sent your Son to become man. Lord Jesus, thank you for taking on humanity. Uh, Lord, we, we know there are a thousand implications that we didn't even touch, namely our complaints about um, our plight as humans are unfounded because, Lord, we know that you know exactly what it's like because you've not only experienced this, but you experience it and never failed where we have. And so, Lord, as we study your, your story in the Gospel of Mark and as we see the glory of, that you have shown forth and the glory of your Father that you put on display, uh, Lord, we just pray that you would teach us once again that there's just nothing like this. There's no religion ever invented by mankind anywhere throughout the history of time that would ever have invented a religion with a deity identifying with, associating with, and becoming like people that he could never be innately attracted to. And yet you did. You identified with us out of your great love, not out of our, our great worth. You identified with us with, with no attraction uh, to us, but simply attraction to your own glory and a condescending love for us. And so, Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for the glory that you show here in the Gospel of Mark, and we thank you for the fact that we can trust you. Thank you for the fact that we have an example in you, Thank you that we have a substitute, we have provision, we have everything we need in your Son by the virtue of the ministry of your Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen.